You? 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 Yeah. Me? Yeah. Yeah. Welcome back, everyone. It's Charlie. This will be my Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse review video. This is meant to be part two of at least a Spider-Verse trilogy that we know of right now. They could always wind up making a fourth film. The first movie, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, is still one of the best Spider-Man movies of all time, so making a sequel that could hit that level or be even better was a really tall order. If you're new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to get all the videos. I'm giving away tickets to the movie to random commenters. All you have to do to enter is just be a subscriber and post your favorite Spider-Verse moments from the trailers so far on the video. And please don't post spoilers if you have seen the movie. I'm working on videos for the ending, post credit scene, full breakdown, Easter eggs for everything that'll start posting later this week after it comes out in theaters, just like I do for all my other movies. Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse follows Miles Morales about a year since becoming Spider-Man. He's in his second year of high school this time and has been active as Spider-Man in the New York City area having adventures long enough that the local store owners have started creating merch based on him. The same way in the first movie that that big Stanley cameo scene was him selling the Spider-Man Halloween costumes to Miles, but that was based on that universe's version of Peter Parker Spider-Man. He enjoys being Spider-Man. He's trying to deal with being Spider-Man and trying to be a normal kid at the same time, like just go to school and be Spider-Man at the same time. He misses the rest of the team from the first movie, like Peter B. Parker and most of all, Spider-Gwen, who is going by the name Spider-Woman. They refer to her several times in the movie as Spider-Woman. I believe they also made that change in the comics too, where they just call the character Spider-Woman. Because if she used Gwen in her name in her universe, everybody would know instantly who she was. More importantly, speaking of Gwen, she's become a much bigger character than she was in the first movie. Haley Steinfeld, of course, is amazing as the character. I really hope someday we'll get to see a live action version of her. She also plays Kate Bishop in all the MCU stuff, so that'd be a really funny scene for them to try and pull off during Secret Wars. But when you think of the Spider-Verse movies, you mostly think of them as Miles Morales movies with many, many, in this case, thousands of other versions of Spider-Man running around. But the sequel actually elevates Gwen Stacy in the story to more like a second main lead role. And the opening of the movie is completely dedicated to her. It starts in her universe. We learn more about her backstory, her character, the relationship she has with the other characters in her universe, the way that the people of her New York think of her. And her actions throughout the movie drive the plot just as Miles Morales' actions do. I suspect that'll continue into part three, where she'll be just as big a character as Miles Morales'. The marketing for the movie wanted you to think that the main villain is actually Spider-Man 2099, played by Oscar Isaac, who returns from the post credit scene in the first movie. He's obviously fantastic in anything he does. It's fun to see him as Moon Knight in the MCU stuff, and now as Spider-Man 2099. Maybe if we cross our fingers someday, we'll also see him as live-action Spider-Man 2099. In his universe, in the year 2099, like the comics, he's created a giant team of multiverse versions of Spider-Man called the Spider-Force. During the movie, they're dedicated to protecting what they call the canon, which is what he calls the stability of the multiverse, held together by a web-like structure like the Spider-Verse, the Spider-Web of timelines. In the comics and in the movie, they also refer to it as the Spider-Verse theory of the multiverse. It's a different way of visualizing the multiverse, but it's the same basic concept as what we saw during the Loki series with all the timelines all connected. The movie is way more meta and way more comic booky than the first movie was, if you can believe that. If you're not familiar with the term canon, it's short for canonical. It means it represents the original author's continuity of the story universe, like what they deem as the actual story being. For example, in the MCU Marvel movies, Kevin Feige is the keeper of the canon, so he says what is canon and what is not. So unless Kevin Feige makes a change in a Marvel movie, it's not canon to the official overarching story. There'll be lots of questions about this in the next couple weeks because the whole Doctor Strange Spider-Man No Way Home reference in all the trailers where he calls the MCU Earth, Earth 19999. And in the last few Marvel movies, Kevin Feige has been calling it Earth 616. Don't worry, I will address that during my full breakdown, full Easter eggs video. It gets really technical. In the movie though, it's something that they just brush past by. It doesn't stop the movie short or anything like that. Like you don't get tripped up on the logic. Which is another important detail, even though there are like a thousand different Easter eggs in every single scene. I'm gonna have to watch the movie like five times just to do my full breakdown video. It doesn't weigh the movie down, especially if you're not a big comic book fan or you haven't seen a ton of other comic book movies or even Spider-Man movies. But it does work for the most hardcore Spider-Man stand. If you've seen Spider-Man everything, if you're walking around in Spider-Man PJs, if you were born watching Spider-Man stuff, 
Every movie, every TV show, every comic book, every product tie-in, even the toys, going back to the classic toys, are referenced in this movie in some way. They throw down the gauntlet like even the most ardent Easter egg hunter will have to watch this movie a thousand times. The actual main villain of the story, for this part and for part three, Beyond the Spider-Verse, is The Spot, played by Jason Schwartzman, who has a special connection with Miles Morales more so than any of the other characters that goes back to Miles getting the spider bite and becoming a version of Spider-Man. Pretty much everyone from the first movie is back, some more so than others, and there were so many cameo scenes that were not in the trailer. I'll have to talk about that later this week, just because a lot of them are really spoilery. But they will blow your mind with the whole multiverse, Kang Dynasty, Avengers 5, Avengers 6, Secret Wars of it all. Everything is connected through the Spider-Verse. Generally, the themes of the movie are mostly about this concept that it is possible to change the canon without completely destroying everything that you love. Like you're a fan of something, someone can come along and do something that's non-canonical and it won't completely destroy the thing that you loved. The idea that doing something different and unexpected with pre-existing characters and tropes can lead to amazing things to make more Spider-Man puns. The movie's full of puns, as you would expect. The thing the movie does really well, like the deeper meaning of the movie, is in justifying Miles Morales' existence as a version of Spider-Man in the movie universe, like in the story universe, but also in real life. Like we talk about movies justifying their existence, like why do we need 20 Avengers movies? This movie literally tells you why we need Miles Morales as a character in real life. If you don't know the story behind the creation of Miles Morales, Brian Michael Bendis created the character after seeing Donald Glover in real life wear a Spider-Man t-shirt during an episode of Community. That's how new the character Miles Morales is. And the whole idea is that at the time, it was super controversial. People were like, no way the Donald Glover could ever play a version of Spider-Man. So Brian Michael Bendis is like, you know what? I'm going to make him a version of Spider-Man. And that wound up being the Miles Morales character, essentially. And now as we're talking, as me posting this video, the movie across the Spider-Verse basically takes that topic head on. Like, you'll understand once you see it, the whole message of the movie is that you can create some totally new version of Spider-Man who isn't Peter Parker that doesn't look like this, and it won't destroy all of reality in all these pre-existing comics. Overall, the story is great. I do have minor complaints about the way they cut the ending, though, the whole part three beyond the Spider-Verse of it all, just the way they edited the ending that I'll address in a second. All the actors were amazing, even the smaller cameo actors that just had really small speaking parts. There were about 280 different versions of Spider-Man in the movie, but only about 95 of them are meant to be versions from the comics that people who are big comic book fans would recognize. And of those 95, only a handful of them actually have speaking lines. And you've probably seen some crazy theories that people have about the movie, but that doesn't cover the half of the stuff that they pull off. Just talking about the animation, because the animation in the first movie was so off the chain, Sony even patented their animation style from the first movie. Nowadays, Spider-Verse is like a noun that people use to describe that particular animation style. Like They started using similar techniques in the new Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie, and it looks great. It's like computer animation, but done to look like hand-drawn animation. And where the movie goes so hard, like they didn't need to go this hard, but they totally did it, is that for all the different main versions of Spider-Man, like there are a handful that are main versions, all of them are animated in completely different styles unique to the characters. For example, in Spider-Gwen's universe, it looks kind of like this, like pastels, the colors of the universe and the characters while they're interacting also change color based on her mood second to second. So there's this really cool effect of shifting colors that you see when you're in her universe. Miles Morales' universe, even Spider-Man 2099's universe, are animated in a slightly more traditional style. Hobie Brown's Spider-Punk probably has the most different-looking animation. He's played by Daniel Kaluuya, who was in the first Black Panther movie. And I'd say of all the new big characters, he's probably one of my favorites, just because I don't consider Oscar Isaac's Spider-Man 2099 to be a new character, even though they changed the way that his character model looks. They made him look way more monstrous for this movie, but Hobie Brown's Spider-Punk is animated in a very punk rock type of style. Thematically, he serves as a guide for Miles and Gwen and is this force of chaos and rebellion in keeping with the tone and the origins of his character. Like the name implies, Spider-Punk, he feels like he's right out of that classic punk movement in real life. They did a bunch of new music, and even though What's Up Danger in the music from the first movie is so awesome, it's really hard to top, Metro Boomin also made some really cool new tracks. They even gave him a cameo in the movie. He's in all the trailers. He's the guy with the joke about Miles finding somewhere else to run. 
They brought on all new directors working on this movie. There was Joaquin Dos Santos, who Avatar The Last Airbender fans will remember. A lot of classic animation fans. Ken Powers, Justin K. Thompson. They did a great job. And the reason why they need three directors for all these movies, like there were three directors on the first Spider-Verse movie, is because the movies are so big. It's so much work. Like it took them four years just to get this out. And part of the rumor is that originally Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse was this giant movie that got so big that they just split it in half. And the second part, like part two, wound up being Beyond the Spider-Verse and they'll release it next year. And that's why it's coming out next year, not in another four years like it would normally take. Like they pulled an Avengers Infinity War and an Avengers Endgame. If you remember when they first announced those movies, it was Infinity War Part 1 and Infinity War Part 2 just because they wanted to break the movie into two halves. But then they changed the name to Part 2 to Avengers Endgame just because eventually the movie changed so much that it felt like a completely different type of story. Overall, I think Spider-Man Across the Spiders came close to topping the first movie. It's at least tied now for two of the top five Spider-Man movies of all time. And I really hope that part three Beyond the Spider-Verse is at least as good as this was. Here's where we get to a couple of my minor complaints though, and it mostly has to do with the way they edited the ending. They definitely understood the assignment that this was meant to be part one of a part two movie. Like, all right, like they almost felt like they ended right in the middle of a sentence, so to speak. Now, it wasn't quite the same as Fast X. They kind of did the same thing with the recent Fast and Furious movie where they literally just, boom, cut to black, like someone cut it in the middle of a scene. I saw an early version of the movie, so they might tweak this a little bit in the final theatrical version, but it did feel like they just had a hard out, like, you know what, we're just going to set all this stuff up, and it was almost a harder ending than Empire Strikes Back. I fully expect part three Beyond the Spider-Verse to pick up immediately where this movie leaves off and maybe they'll introduce some feature when both the Blu-rays for the movies eventually come out in a couple years where you can just cue them up like it just plays as a three hour movie. It just happens to be on two different discs. So in that way, it's a little bit more like the Matrix movies, like Matrix Reloaded ends in a weird way because you knew you were going to get the rest of the story in Matrix Revolutions within a couple months. We got to wait a year to get part three, but it won't be that long. Normally, we'd be waiting like four years for the next part of the story. But I was really happy with the way they pulled things off, and there is so much to talk about, so be sure to go see the movie as soon as possible. My videos for the ending, post credit scene, full breakdown Easter eggs will start posting Thursday and Friday, so look out for those. Everyone click here for my Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse ending and post credit scene video and click here for that full breakdown and Easter eggs for the entire movie. I'll update the links as soon as I post those. Thank you so much for watching. Everyone stay safe and I'll see you guys in the next one.